Hello, this is Brian Auten of Apologetics 315. Today's interview is with Christian philosopher of religion Richard Swinburne. He is an emeritus professor of philosophy at the University of Oxford, and over the last 50 years, Swinburne has been a proponent of philosophical arguments for the existence of God. Among his many books, some of his most popular have been The Coherence of Theism, The Existence of God, Faith and Reason, Providence and the Problem of Evil, The Resurrection of God Incarnate, and Was Jesus God? The purpose of today's interview is to explore the existence of God and the challenge of the problem of evil, as well as his advice for apologists. Well, thanks for joining me today, Professor Swinburne. Well, thank you for inviting me. Well, Professor Swinburne, I think uh, many will be familiar with your work as a prominent philosopher of religion, and the academic contribution you've made in defending Christian theism is substantial. But would you mind just sharing a bit about yourself and how you became a Christian? Um, well, I was uh, baptized at uh, the age of uh, 15. That's uh, when one formally becomes a Christian. But I think I, uh, so far as my memory stretches back, I always believed there was a God. Um, but that was my formal Christianization. Can you tell us a little bit about how you grew in your Christian faith and maybe what interested you in philosophy of religion? What got you along that track? Uh, yes. Um, uh, since I clearly adopted Christian beliefs early, I had no idea why I adopted them, but uh, they, they stayed with me. Um, but um, I've always been interested in, in big metaphysical issues, free will, the objectivity of morals, mind and body, which are all, of course, connected with uh, religion. Um, and uh, I've always enjoyed uh, serious, um, rigorous arguments. So philosophy was a natural occupation for me, and being uh, religious, um, I came to realize when studying philosophy at Oxford that um, although I didn't think very much of the currently fashionable results in philosophy, I thought that its tools of rigorous and careful argument could be used in uh, defense of religious views. I use this word defense. I don't like it very much um, because I think argument should be uh, it can be used to, as it were, advocate it, not merely defend it against opposition, but um, advocate it uh, um, uh, positively. But at any rate, um, uh, I thought that uh, both for defense and more important, therefore, advocating positively the Christian religion, um, philosophical results and uh, techniques could be of use. And I therefore started eventually to philosophize about religion, but I realized that I would, uh, uh, that what people assumed as the current uh, paradigm of knowledge in the modern world was science and its achievements. And I hadn't done very much science at school, uh, but I had a couple of research fellowships and I spent uh, quite a lot of time working on the history of science and trying to understand why scientists had uh, come to the views they had. And then I spent the first uh, eight or nine years of my philosophical career just writing about the philosophy of science. Um, but I think I always had it in mind to apply my thought eventually to uh, the examination of um, religious claims. Um, and so I did, equipped with various results and uh, techniques of my own, which I had developed while thinking about science. Well, I'm curious about how you have seen the landscape of, if you will, Christian philosophy change over the past number of decades. What was it like when you began as a philosopher uh, compared to what we see now with there being a lot more interest and uh, openness to Christian philosophy? Yes, it's been a remarkable change. Uh, when I was um, an undergraduate at Oxford, uh, theologians didn't seem to be very interested in uh, um, justifying their belief that there was a God. They were sort of working within a system and uh, um, quite happy with um, uh, biblical exegesis without trying to produce any defense about why one should uh, uh, trust the Bible, let alone why 
I wanted to breathe there as a god. Um, and it was a pretty poor state of affairs, I thought. It hasn't entirely changed on the theological side either. But um, philosophers were simply not interested in the question of the uh, of religion or interest. Um, they, they thought that um, one couldn't argue about these matters, and it was a pretty irrational belief, but it wasn't even worth sharing with it. It was an irrational belief. Though, of course, there was a school of philosophy which did try and show it was an irrational belief, this logical positivism. Um, and then there was the school of logical analysis, which... Um, uh, or rather, um, that's the wrong word for it, a Wittgensteinian approach which tried to analyze religious talk in terms of simply what one said in church without any metaphysical commitment. But that, that era has passed, and um, uh, what has happened in the past 50 years is that um, philosophers um, are no more religious than ever they were, but um, uh, the philosophy faculties have appreciated that the kind of approach to religion which has been taken not merely by me, but by various American philosophers, Alvin Plantinga, Robert Adams, Bill Alston, and so on, uh, who, who have been using all the techniques and results in other areas of philosophy and applying them to justification of religious belief, um, my uh, secular philosophy uh, colleagues have recognized that this is a branch of philosophy, and therefore uh, lots of undergraduates take uh, a paper in philosophy of religion uh, as part of their philosophy syllabus uh, at Oxford and in most other universities throughout the world. And this has been a marvelous development. Um, and uh, I hope eventually it will pay off with... Uh, um, more people appreciating the rational justification of Christianity. But at any rate, um, the development of the past 50 years has certainly opened the question within philosophy. Well, I know that there are many who certainly appreciate your contribution, uh, Professor Swinburne. Now, you did mention the word defense and how philosophical arguments can be used to defend Christianity, but you also mentioned the importance of advocating it. And so this next question might just be an unpacking of that idea, perhaps. But what do you feel is the goal for the Christian who may be doing philosophy today? Well, um, let's be clear, philosophical problems are of interest in themselves, and one can be a Christian and uh, do worthwhile work on the nature of mathematics, for example. Um, and that doesn't have, to my mind, any particular immediate uh, consequences for religion. Mm. And it's nevertheless uh, a worthwhile academic enterprise. But that being said, if, if they wish to have and it's good that they should apply their philosophical techniques to um, religious beliefs, then um, the, the first thing they might consider is whether there are good arguments from agreed premises, that is to say, from obvious truths we can recognize in the world, to the existence of God. And it, it has, in my view, always been a uh, part of the Christian intellectual tradition, at any rate, for the first 1,800 years of its existence, that there were good arguments from the natural world to the existence of God. Um, uh, Christian theologians didn't claim everybody ought to believe on the basis of arguments, but they thought the arguments were there, and uh, intellectuals who wondered about whether there was a God could be shown this by means of argument. And um, that seems to me uh, an important element in the Christian message. And therefore, um, I have done quite a lot of work on this, of course, and other people have. And uh, any Christian who is uh, growing up philosophically and wishes to apply their philosophy to their religious beliefs uh, should consider whether these arguments work, whether they can be improved, whether they can produce other ones. Um, and so on. But, of course, also there are issues of defense. Um, we'll come on, I believe, shortly to the issue of the problem of evil, but clearly 
there are arguments against the existence of God, and um, anyone who uh, uh, wishes to think about their religion wants to consider whether these arguments work or not, and if they don't, why they don't. So there's work to be done on both sides, and not merely with regard to the existence of God, that is to say, particular propositions of Christian doctrine uh, can be argued for and against. And although historical elements come into such arguments, they're not the only elements that come into such arguments. Uh, For example, one may argue for the doctrine of the Trinity on the grounds it's uh, a biblical doctrine, well, perhaps, uh, on the grounds that the Church has taught it, yes. But I also think there are a priori rational arguments why God should, as it were, um, uh, uh, be three. It's not putting it quite correctly, of course, why, if there is only one divine person, the Father, why he should from eternity uh, create, create's not the right word, keep in being uh, to other divine persons. And um, I have argued on those lines. So both for the existence of God and for um, particular Christian doctrines, there are arguments for and arguments against and arguments need to be analyzed in careful detail, uh, pursued, um, advocated popularly. That is to say, one can argue about these matters at a very sophisticated level or at a more popular level, or at a very popular level, or at a very sophisticated level. There's a scope for work at all levels, and... um, I've written a couple of fairly popular books, but most of my work has been relatively sophisticated, and therefore I've tried to appeal to um, professional philosophers as well as people who don't know anything about it. Now, I think about some of the books you've written, uh, books like Is There a God? or The Coherence of Theism, The Existence of God, Faith and Reason. Uh, You write about the problem of evil, uh, the resurrection, Was Jesus God?, and there's this huge list of, of works that you've done, uh, so many of them dealing with things pertinent to the defense of the truth of Christianity. I, I'm just curious, of the areas that you've explored in doing philosophical work, what's been maybe the uh, area of most interest to you personally, and why? I think they've all been of interest to me. <laughs> um, I find it very difficult to, to select uh, one above the other, uh, but uh, I suppose the two, the two most important ones for for the Christian uh, faith itself are the arguments from the natural world to the existence of God and um, the argument against from the problem of evil. And um, I suppose I've devoted more of my time to those two matters than, than to anything else. Um, as you may know, I think there are uh, powerful arguments, not compelling deductive arguments, but probabilistic arguments from the very orderliness of the world, that is to say, uh, the fact that every particle of matter conforms to exactly the same scientific laws, in other words, behaves in exactly the same way as every other particle, and that this... Um, uh, total organization of the world is evidence of um, a creator who made it thus. It would be an extraordinary coincidence if everything behaved in the same way, and there wasn't an explanation of it. Um, But um, there is a suitable and simple explanation available, and therefore I think the evidence makes it very probable that there is a creator God who sustains the world like that. Conversely, the problem of evil is a very serious problem. God is supposed to be perfectly good, and yet there is sin and suffering, and uh, that needs to be explained. And um, uh, thinking about it uh, leads one to think about uh, uh, what uh, what perfect goodness would amount to in an omnipotent being such as God, and how he would deal with his creatures, and that is interesting, very interesting, but it's also um, deeply relevant to people's personal lives. And um, I suppose these two areas have occupied me more than other areas, but um, the other areas are very interesting.
interesting and important too. Mm-hmm. Well, let's talk a bit about the existence of God. As you know, apologists uh, can take a whole variety of approaches when it comes to exploring that topic. So you kind of started there to talk about sort of the approach that you take in your work. Um, why do you take uh, that angle? And can you talk maybe uh, a little bit about maybe the probabilistic uh, nature of your approach? Uh, yes. Well, I take that angle because arguments need to start from where the person you're arguing with um, is. <laughs> uh, Gregory of Nyssa, the great 4th century Christian theologian, said if you're talking to somebody, you have to start from what they take for granted. And so, if you're arguing with, with um, a, a Jew, uh, you start from the Old Testament. And if you're arguing with a polytheist, you start from, at any rate, a belief in some gods. Uh, but if you start arguing with an atheist, then you have to start from something he assumes. And what he assumes, says Gregory, is that it's a, an orderly world. Now, of course, Gregory didn't have our science, but uh, his point um, can easily be put in terms of our science, indeed, uh, much more forcibly, perhaps, in terms of our science than in terms of his. That is, um, every, as I said before, every atom, every particle of which the atoms are made, um, uh, conforms to the four... Uh, uh, types of laws of nature, the, um, the gravitational law, the electromagnetic law, the law of the strong force, and the law of the weak force, um, and uh, to say that it conforms to the law just is to say that it behaves in the way that the law, which is not something independent from the particles, it's just a statement of the way they behave, um, and um, that is a very remarkable fact. And uh, anybody who is at all influenced by the scientific method should be looking for an answer of that. Uh, if you find all the coins in some deposit have got the same marks on them, you presume they come, or it's very, very probable they come from the same mold. And uh, it's therefore very, very probable that there is the same origin, a common origin for the uh, uniformity of nature, which I've described, and the principles uh, whereby we uh, look, uh, think that um, some postulated cause is probably is the cause, is if the explanation in terms of that cause leads you to expect the data, if you wouldn't uh, ex uh, expect to find the data unless that explanation were true, and if the explanation is a simple one, then the explanation is probably true. Uh, uh, if there is a God, he's perfectly good. One of the good things he will try to bring about is us, because we have uh, a unique value in having a choice between good and evil and being able to influence ourselves and each other and the world. And God will therefore seek to bring about humans. Uh, and many other things as well, but uh, humans certainly. Uh, but if he is to do this, um, he must uh, provide us with a, a physical universe. We are embodied creatures. And um, if, uh, if we are to use the universe either to benefit other people or to harm them, there have to be regularities in the behavior of things. Um, if I want to benefit my family by building a house, then think bricks have got to stay on top of each other and not, not wander around the universe. And if I want to grow food for my family, then it has to be the case if I sow seeds and water them, they'll produce food. So there have to be regularities in the world. Um, and likewise, if I'm to harm, have the choice of harming people, there also has to be regularities has to be the case, but um, if I make a fire and uh, light somebody else's house, then it will burn down. Um, so it has to be a world where there are simple regularities which humans can understand and then utilize for good or evil. And, of course, these laws of nature have to be such as to produce human bodies. 
And so, um, if there is a God, we would expect um, a physical universe, a universe governed by simple laws of nature, and these laws being such as to produce humans. On the other hand, if there is no God, this enormous coincidence represented by the conformity of all objects to natural laws is very, very improbable. Um, postulating God is postulating a simple being, uh, just one being, that is to say. Simplicity is a matter of postulating few entities, few kinds of entities, um, few properties, few kinds of properties, and mathematically simple relations between them. Um, you can get all the other divine properties by postulating that God is omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly free. Um, persons, what makes a person is having some power, uh, having some beliefs, and uh, being able to, di <laughs> and having a choice as to how to exercise that power. Uh, to postulate a God is to postulate a being with powers, beliefs, and um, to which there are no limits, and uh, a freedom of choice um, which is uninfluenced by anything outside himself. So it's postulating a limitless um, knowledge, power, and freedom. And to postulate something with zero limit is much more simple than postulating something with a very large value of knowledge but not total knowledge or very much um, power but not total power and so on. So, uh, enormous reason to suppose that um, uh, by simple probabilistic arguments that uh, there is such uh, a being. Uh, if there is a God who is omniscient, he will know what things are good and what things are bad and um, being free from influence from outside, um, he will have no temptation to do what is bad. Seeing something is good, he will do it. So we would expect him to bring about us. So, um, <coughs> excuse me, in summary, um, given my three data that I've mentioned, um, uh, the postulation of a god is such as uh, satisfies the normal scientific criteria for a good explanation. It's simple. If it's true, you would expect the data. If it's false, you wouldn't expect the data. And that's what makes it probably true. I've always found that uh, argument very powerful. And I think uh, the average scientist who says, oh, well, these are the laws of nature. We shouldn't look for an explanation is really uh, just not pursuing the scientific method to its logical conclusion. So you've laid out a case for the existence of God, and uh, often you're going to receive various challenges, maybe on some of the points of your argument for God's existence, but also, you know, some of the bigger challenges might be, say, the problem of evil, yes, as you indeed. mentioned. But uh, in your experience, what have been the biggest challenges you've encountered to Christianity? And maybe we could bracket the problem of evil, because that always seems to top the list. What other sorts of objections do you find most common? <laughs> well, you are right to bracket it. It is certainly the, the major worry uh, for anybody. Um, but that said, well, other well... Um, Yes, indeed. Uh, there are. Um, there is the argument from hiddenness. There is the argument. Well, if God is perfectly good, surely He would make Himself known to us. If uh, Father produces children and hides, then um, uh, He can't be a very good Father. Is that? Uh, but most of the other arguments against. Uh, well, there are arguments saying my argument is for is weak, and so on. But apart from that, there are, of course, arguments against particular Christian doctrines. And um, the central Christian doctrine on which uh, so much depends is the doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus. And um, uh, so, uh, um, clearly, there are historical issues here of whether the testimony of the Gospels is reliable in this respect. But not only historical issues, because um, 
I think from the nature of God himself, one would have reason to suppose that he would become incarnate and show that he had done so by, by some super miracle such as rising from the dead. So, um, uh, uh, those arguments about what happened in the life of Jesus are important. Also, there are arguments about whether Christian doctrines are moral or compatible with each other. People find the doctrine of the Trinity very uh, paradoxical. Um, uh, and um, then, uh, uh, I should have said this before, as regards the, the, the traditional predicates of God, the, the properties of omnipotence, omniscience, perfect goodness, and so on, which are rightly said to be essential properties of God, uh, people find, um, some people suggest we can't make sense of these or they're not compatible with each other, uh, and um, that needs, there are difficulties there, I think they can be met. Um, they are not, I think, the, the difficulties of the, the ordinary non-philosophical uh, man in the pew, but um, there are difficulties that need to be met. Um, there are various paradoxes saying, well, if some snow paradox, could an omnipotent being make a stone too heavy for him to lift? Uh, if he could, then he's not, not omnipotent, and if he couldn't, then he's not omnipotent. That, that can be met, but I mean, there are all these sort of internal difficulties. Uh, more seriously is the difficulty about divine omniscience. People say, well, if God is omniscient, how can he know our future free actions? And that is an important difficulty, which uh, does need to be resolved. I have my, my own solution to it, but um, there are all these areas in which um, there is scope for meeting objections, developing uh, answers, and developing answers which helps one, I think, to understand God a bit better. The, it's not just a matter of arguing for and against. The arguments inevitably take the form of thinking about what a God would be like and how he would deal with things. And that, um, if one starts thinking that through, I think one begins to understand a bit more about uh, God, not merely for purposes of argument, but for purposes of worship. Well, very good. Now, let's uh, take those brackets off the problem of evil and, and talk about that for a moment. And uh, You know, this seems to be interwoven into this grand narrative of history, um, can we unpack it from this angle? If God is good and yet in control of everything, why all the evil in the world? Now let's understand what we mean by evil. Um, there is the, the badness of, of uh, suffering and the badness of sin, and they are quite different from each other. Um, I don't think Jesus came to earth to deal with suffering, uh, but he did come to earth to deal with sin. Uh, the word evil, I think, is <laughs> is a bit. Of, uh, what the problem that worries most people is not the problem of sin, because uh, they can understand people make their own choices, and if God has given us the free choices, is the normal Christian view, uh, people are likely to sin. But what does worry people is the problem of suffering. Um, and that does need an answer. Why does a good God allow people to suffer? And um, the first part of the answer is going to be, must be, in terms of the free will defense. That is to say, quite a lot of the suffering in the world is either caused by some human uh, deliberately or, uh, more commonly, by some human negligently allowing something to occur. Um, the latter is rather important a great deal of the recent famines in Africa, for example, nobody deliberately brought them about, but uh, a lot of people could have done something a lot earlier to stop them, and so they are curbed through human negligence. Now, uh, if God is to... Uh, it's a great gift from God to give to humans not just free will to choose between good and evil, but free will to make a difference to themselves and each other. Uh, a good God can 
be expected, not certainly, but with some probability, to give to humans a deep responsibility for each other, so that whether something goes well or ill with one human depends on other humans. Pragmatically, of course, um, parents have this enormous responsibility for their children, but uh, we're all, to a rather lesser extent, responsible for each other, and uh, what we do makes a very difference to each other, and it makes a great difference to ourselves. Um, now, God could, of course, made, have made us so that automatically we do good, but we wouldn't have been responsible for each other then, because uh, what would happen to one person would be entirely independent of what anybody else did, and uh, so there would be no... God wouldn't have trusted us, and it's a great gift from someone to give you responsibility. But humans cannot have responsibility in a big way for each other unless they have it in their power either to benefit or to harm each other. And, of course, if they make the wrong choice, people will get hurt. And that is the beginning of the answer. Now, of course, not all e and evil, which is evil suffering, which is brought about by other humans or through other humans allowed to occur, it is normally called moral evil. But there is also natural evil, which is the evil for which you... I keep using the word evil, it is the way the problem is phrased, and, but I'm concerned with suffering. It's the suffering which um, is uh, not caused by any other human. The suffering of diseases and accidents which we haven't yet learned to uh, uh, cure. Um, why does God allow these things? Well, uh, just think if there were no diseases, no accidents, nothing like that. Uh, if we suppose we all got old, um, but um, uh, <laughs> kept all our powers until the moment of death, uh, many people wouldn't have any serious uh, uh, opportunity to face up to difficult problems. Um, if, if I uh, get ill, then I have a choice, a choice as to whether to uh, cope with this bravely, not complain, uh, um, be agreeable despite my pain and so on, or to whine. And you also have a choice, uh, if you are close to me, as to whether to look after me, care for me, sympathize with me, or be callous. That is to say, it's when we're in a bad way that the, the really serious choices come to ourselves and to other people. Um, and uh, uh, if there weren't these opportunities for very serious choice, we wouldn't have a great deal of opportunity for benefiting or harming each other. We could avoid these serious choices. Uh, maybe they happen to other people or other lands, but we're all faced with this because of the frailty of old age, the prevalence of disease, and so on. And that does force us to make the serious choices. And when we do make serious choices, uh, they don't merely affect the other person, they affect ourselves, because each time we make a good choice, it becomes easier to make a good choice next time. Each time we make a bad choice, it becomes natural to make a bad choice next time. That is to say, we form our character by these choices. So the natural evil is uh, the grit which allows the pearl to develop. It's... Um, what gives us the opportunity to make ourselves um, in a way that we wouldn't otherwise have. Of course, uh, God would be crazy to give us this sort of choice for eternity, but um, he doesn't. He gives us this sort of choice for somewhere around 80 years, and um, that's a very limited time in the time of eternity, but a time when by coping with evils, we can make ourselves good people or allow ourselves to become bad people. And, and uh, 
a limited evil, it is a limited evil in time, very limited evil in time, does allow us to do that. And that is certainly the framework of my theodicy, that is, explanation of why God allows uh, evil to occur. But, of course, you also asked, uh, evil is also the problem of sin. Um, and if God's to give us free will, uh, we have it in our... Uh, we, we can make the wrong choice, and so sin. And that is one place in which Jesus comes in. Um, I think there are two basic reasons for the incarnation, for Jesus coming to earth and living a life, a hard life as it was. Um, remember the saying, the Son of Man has no where to lay his head, uh, ending in uh, a one of the worst deaths that uh, the then civilization could provide, um, being crucified on a uh, unjust uh, charge. Now, um, if if I'm a father and I make my child suffer for a good cause, there comes a time when I've got to suffer with him. And if God makes us suffer for a good cause, and I've argued it is for a good cause, there comes a time when he's got to suffer with us. Um, just to give you a, an example, a human type example. Um, suppose a country's at war and um, young men are called up to fight in the army, but um, they can be excused if uh, their, their parents write and say, uh, we need him at home. And suppose I'm a father and my son is called up and he asks me to uh, write him a letter of excuse, but I say, no, I won't do this, um, you must fight. Uh, if I could, if I, maybe I don't have to fight because I'm uh, old enough not to be conscripted, but I could volunteer. At that point, there becomes a certain obligation of me to volunteer. If I make him fight, I ought to fight too. Well, if God makes us suffer for a good cause, suffer a lot, he has to suffer with us in the end. And that is, I think, the first reason for the incarnation and the crucifixion. It's God's identifying with the worst that people go through. But, of course, there's a further issue. If people sin, and sin a lot, as indeed they do, um, something has to be done about it. Now, if I do wrong to you, if I hurt you in some way, then, of course, I need to repent and apologize. Uh, but if I hurt you in a big way, then that's not quite enough. I have to make reparation. For example, if I steal something from you, it's no good just saying, apolog just apologizing, I have to give it back. And if I've destroyed it, then I have to give something in return. And if, for example, I owe you a service and I haven't done it, then I ought to repent and apologize, but I ought to do it as well. Now, suppose I can't do it. Um, well, uh, uh, somebody else could volunteer to do it instead of me. Um, and we do uh, allow, for example, if somebody is fined by a court, but they can't pay the fine, then uh, someone else can pay the fine for them, so long as they agree that someone else is acting on their behalf. And um, uh, we think, naturally, that it's a good thing that those who have done serious wrong should not merely repent and apologize, but some make some effort at reparation. And if they can't make that effort at reparation, at least they should try and persuade somebody else to do the, uh, who can help them in this regard, to, to do it for them. If they owe someone a service and can't perform it, at any rate, they should make some effort to persuade someone else to, and so on. Well, that is where the attainment comes in. Um, Jesus offered his life as an atonement. That is to say, he 
said, we could, when we have sinned, we could repent and apologize. And since we couldn't do for God what we ought to have done, uh, what we could do is uh, say, I have lived a bad life, I cannot now live a good life, but I would ask you to take the life of Jesus instead as my reparation. That is to say, Jesus provides a reparation which those who join themselves to him in in uh, becoming Christians um, that can offer to God as their reparation. So I think uh, the uh, life and death of Jesus um, uh, are two, for two reasons, different responses to the two senses of the problem of evil. They, they are responses to the problem of suffering uh, because God making us suffer for a good cause um, accepts that he will suffer with us. Uh, but they are also a response to human sin in making available a reparation which we can offer when we have failed to live the life that we should have done. So that's, I think, how he fits in. Oh, well, thank you for that. One objection that I've heard a number of times is the idea that, you know, okay, God allows these evils or this suffering, but uh, even though it may be man doing these uh, evil things or causing these things, but doesn't that make God, in allowing that evil, culpable of that evil? Isn't it make him the one who's the ultimate cause? And uh, does that do anything to affect the... Um, morality of God himself? Uh, no. Um, uh, parents allow their children, to a very limited extent, to do things that they disapprove of. That is to say, they don't stop them. Um, to a very limited extent, that is right. Um, as the child grows up, parents uh, don't keep an eye on the child all the time. They know the child may do something wrong, but uh, they're not there to stop it. And we think that's right uh, within limits. Uh, that's to say, parents should not be uh, um, looking <laughs> at keeping a child under their total control every moment. Um, they should allow a child certain freedom of action, including the possibility of hurting other people. But of course, only within limits. Um, the reason why parents have the right to do this is because parents are responsible f for the existence and uh, of their children, with, but of co only in a very limited way. That is to say, uh, all a parent can do is um, act in accordance with uh, uh, the powers which God has given them. Um, but God is responsible for our existence, totally responsible for our existence, and therefore has very great, much more right to allow us to do wrong than our parents do. Uh, God certainly doesn't want us to sin, but God wants us to have responsibility and free choice, and God takes the logical consequences of that, and we think that parents um, are right to allow their children to do wrong uh, within limits. We also think that parents are right to allow their children to suffer if it is for a good cause. Um, if a child has to uh, undergo an operation which will be painful, um, we don't think uh, parents are guilty if they uh, <laughs> allow this to happen. And um, uh, it is the same with God, only on a very much larger scale. So, no, uh, God is, only allows sin and suffering for a good cause, and um, within limits, he's right to do so. I stress within limits. Um, the limits are limits of time. Um, and we only have 80 years on this earth, but we have, during that time, the ability to form ourselves for good or evil. 
Well, thank you so much for your answers, uh, Professor Swinburne. And I definitely want to point people to your resources and your books uh, uh, for further reading on these subjects. Obviously, they're, they're huge subjects, and we've just skimmed the surface of your uh, approach to some of the answers. But, Professor Swinburne, as we begin to wrap up, I wonder if you'd mind giving some advice. And many of the listeners to this interview will be those who are wanting to be better defenders of the faith. And let's say if you had a a classroom full of the next generation of Christian apologists and you could offer them just one or two pieces of advice, what what do you think those would be? Um, Well, firstly, take take the people you're talking to seriously. Uh, Find out what their concerns are and find out what their starting point is. What, what, as it were, I quoted Gregory of Nyssa earlier. Uh, find out what they take for granted and then start to start discussing things on that basis. And among the things they all take for granted is that they live in an orderly world governed by scientific laws and that certain things are right and wrong and uh, off we go. Um, and um, uh, another rather obvious piece of advice is... Um, do a lot of reading, and don't just read and read and read, think about it. Uh, think about, um, obviously, read books for the Christian position, but also read books against the Christian position and think how uh, uh, whether uh, the arguments they've read can meet these or objections and how they can meet these objections. Um, uh, spend time reading, but spend time thinking and about what you've read and trying to get clear how uh, how the arguments work. Um, those are, I think, the two main things I would say. Um, and I suppose also I would say, um, uh, please tell people that um, uh, faith doesn't mean believing something on no evidence. Faith means faith is an act of trusting God, and it uh, would be foolish to trust anyone unless you have some reason to suppose they're there and um, uh, have uh, uh, and are benevolently disposed towards you. So one does need some uh, rational justification for the content of belief. Those are the things I, I think I would say to them. Well, thank you so much, Professor Swinburne. Uh, Thanks also for all your work. And again, uh, thanks for taking the time to do this interview. Uh, Thank you. I've been speaking with Professor Richard Swinburne, Emeritus Professor of Philosophy at the University of Oxford. Links to his books and resources can be found at today's blog post at Apologetics 315. I want to take just a moment to thank you for listening to this podcast, and if you are a regular follower of Apologetics 315, I'd like to point you to our Facebook page. If you like Apologetics 315 on Facebook, you'll just get one update a day with a link to the day's blog post, and you'll be able to interact with others who are fans. If you follow on Twitter, you'll get tweets with some of the best links to Apologetics resources throughout the week. I'd also like to ask for your support for Apologetics 315 as we continue to grow as a ministry. We are now a non-profit organization, and our growth depends upon the regular donations of listeners like you. And our goal is to provide free quality resources consistently in order to grow the next generation of Christian apologists. Would you help support this ministry? If so, you can click on the support tab at Apologetics 315 for more information. If you'd like to listen to other podcasts by Apologetics 315, just search in iTunes for a variety of other resources. Would you like to hear a particular scholar or apologist interviewed? Well, contact me and let me know at interviews at apologetics315.com. This is Brian Auten, and thanks for listening.